Sibilance, 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 sibilis, syphilis, sapien, sibilis, testicle. All right. Fun facts about goats. That's what we're discussing today. Actually, we're not. We're not discussing goats at all. Um, <clears throat> today we are going to discuss the fun, important points about uh, layer two isolation. <laughs> Why is layer two isolation so important? Because there's too many people complaining that somebody plugged their router in backwards and they polluted my entire network with rogue DHCP information and it took down half of my network. Well, if that happens, it's because your network wasn't set up properly. And usually that's because you just lack the experience of setting it up. It's not that you are like uh, doing things wrong intentionally it's just many of us are learning and uh now that we have the access to a lot of this equipment um many people can set these networks up but with lacking a bit of information can be a dangerous thing for you it can lead you down the road of hell now some people will say well the way that you have to fix that is you have to do dhcp relay or you need to put firewall rules on your cpes and all that no no because those are all band-aids that don't take care of other problems that uh are present that you're not aware of like, the real issue here is that you're lacking Layer 2 isolation. Why the hell is Layer 2 isolation so important? Hmm, am I on a tangent? No. Alright, why is Layer 2 isolation important? The reason why Layer 2 isolation is so fucking important is you want to isolate your customers. Because you might have that one scumbag little 14-year-old sitting in their parents' basement that's like, Hehe, <laughs> I gotta break in everything and fuck it up. Why? I don't know, because I'm cool. No, uh, you know, the kids watch Hackers once and they become a nightmare to everyone. Um, so the whole idea here is not only for network security, but, you know, for stability and uptime. Because remember, as a small operator, you need to outperform the larger operators. And this, this day and age, that's not that hard. Because a lot of the larger carriers are actually turning into real garbage. Alright, so now, now that I've ranted and explained why it's so important, Here's what it does. Okay, with layer 2 isolation, it does a few things. The most important thing is, is it basically pushes the customer forward. So when you've got clients connected, let's say in a standard scenario where you've got them all connecting to a node, whether it's an access point or an OLT or, uh, you know, a uh, cable head end or any of that stuff, you don't want them to talk to each other. You only want them to move forward in the network. You want them to only talk to, um, you know, the endpoint basically, like the router. So you want it so that, no matter what, that customer's router there can only talk to the router on the other end of the link, okay? The purpose for that is they have no reason, no business accessing your CPEs or access points or switches. You don't want that to happen. And you don't want them to access neighboring equipment, okay? Now, of course, there will be some exceptions to the rule, which can be added. Like if you've got a bunch of businesses, say you've got a farm and they have six facilities and they're all on the same tower, they might want to be able to interconnect between them, but that's another thing we'll get into another day. So how do we solve this problem? How do we stop them from talking to each other, which in turn stops them from polluting into each other with DHCP? Simple. Layer 2 isolation. Okay, so one of the first things that you need to take care of, and by the way, we're going to cover more stuff shortly. I'll go into that in more detail. Let's take a look at a standard uh, Ubiquiti setup, okay? So we've got our router here, okay? We've got, uh, let's see here. Here's our router. Let's just pretend this is the router here, okay? And this goes up to this uh, switch here. We're going to pretend this is a switch. So all these ports in here are participating in the same switch group. Switches have the ability to do layer 2 isolation. And we'll go through that in more detail shortly. So here's one way you can do it in Microtik as an example. We're going to add a identical horizon value to all of these ports. Okay, actually I'm not going to have it on the upstream port. So in here, you want all the downstream ports, which are the ports that are feeding access points or last mile equipment that are downstream from the site to all share the same horizon value. What that's going to do is it'll force them forward. They won't be able to move across these interfaces because if an interface has a horizon value for one, it's not allowed to talk to any other interface with a horizon value of one, okay? Now, if you notice here, I left the upstream port, the one going to the router, as not part of a horizon, okay? So, basically, the horizon is a fancy way of saying a uh, isolation group, right? In the case of Microtik, of course. <clears throat> so, with all these ports here set with the horizon value of 1, not one of them can talk to any other one with the horizon value of 1, but they can all talk to this one. They can talk to the upstream port. So that basically means that you're funneling all the traffic from each of those interfaces forward to the device at the other end of that interface, which will be your router. It'll be your gateway, right? Sorry, I've got allergies. 
I'm gonna be snorting and snuffling. Pfft. Let's just chalk it up as ignorance added to the video for entertainment purposes. All right, so now let's go over here and take a look at how you do it on these ubiquity ones. Now, remember, I'm just giving you a brief overview of this. It's just, I want you to get the idea in your head about how important your toy selection is. So we've got um, right here, this is our trunk port, going back to the main router. And yes, I'm actually on this network, by the way. This is my demo network. All right, we've got access point north, south, east, and west. And then there's me and Dan. Okay, now what we want is we don't want any of these guys because they're all within the same bridge group, I believe. Let's see here. Yep, they're all in the same bridge group, okay? So we don't want any of these guys to be able to talk to each other, okay? We only want them to move forward. How do we do that here? Well, no, in the ubiquity on this new GUI, it's actually relatively simple. You just click on the port and enable isolate port. See? Isolate port. All right, so that's on access point west. Look, isolate port, access point east, south, and north. Okay, <clears throat> now that's on the switch. So if you've got uh, port isolation enabled on the switch, that means that none of these interfaces, five, six, seven, eight, are able to intercommunicate with each other. They can only move the traffic forward, okay? But that means jack shit if you got an access point with about 20 or 30 people on it and they're able to intercommunicate through the access point itself. Uh-oh. That means that one person cannot get everybody connected to that access point. So how do you solve that problem? Once again, we're using ubiquity in this example. Use what you have available to you. Maybe if I had some cambium equipment, I'd be demoing with cambium equipment, but uh, kind of got shot down on that one, so that's a no-go for now. Um, but anyway, we've got uh, client isolation enabled on here. And by the way, this is the same with almost every vendor. Anybody who sells last mile equipment, whether it's Radwin or Cyclu or Mimosa or Ubiquity or, you know, any of those other companies, Cambium, um, Telrad, you know, whatever, they all have the ability in one way or another to enable client isolation, especially with 802.11 based devices. LTE is another nightmare we're not gonna get into today until I become an expert in it, okay? So with all these 802.11 based platforms, it's really simple. Look for the feature that either says layer two isolation or client isolation. Once that's enabled, that's basically the same thing as what you're doing in your switch. That means that all the connected clients on that access point will be, uh, unable to intercommunicate with each other. They can only move forward. So now, <clears throat> to break that down, that means uh, little Mary Lou down the street accidentally plugged in the router at her home backwards, okay? So now the LAN port for her uh, router is broadcasting across the broadcast domain here that's uh, on access point, uh, in this case, north, okay? Who cares? It's not a big deal. Why is it not a big deal? because client isolation is enabled, which means that that broadcast traffic is isolated to that stream. It cannot cross over to any other devices, no other sessions that are present on this access point. Oh, but it's gonna be able to pollute the other access points. No, no it's not, why? Because on here, we have got port isolation enabled on all the other interfaces that are participating within that bridge group, which we shall call last mile. If you notice here, it doesn't matter what switch type I'm using, I typically call the last mile the last mile for the sake of sanity, and any other consultant who looks at it's gonna be like, oh, they called the last mile bridge last mile. Well, that's so pedestrian. Yeah, it's supposed to be easy. Why? Because it's supposed to make sense to everyone. Anybody who comes along and looks at this thing, okay? So now that we've shown you client isolation at the AP, client isolation at the switch, as long as any ports that are participating in the last mile bridge on the uh, router, we'll just pretend that the switch here is the router, by the way, because the router actually here is instead of the bridge. But anyway, as long as all the ports are isolated within the bridge on the router that's, you know, heading out, then there's no problem. All these guys talk to the bridge interface itself. They do not need to talk to each other. So now you've taken that one customer and you have isolated them to themselves. They can't touch anything else. And if you're in a weird scenario where, you know, you've got those neighboring farms, you know, six farms that need to intercommunicate with each other, there's tons of ways you can do that, whether it's with VPNs or whatnot, or tunnels of all sorts of different types, shapes, and forms. Um, so it really is that simple. Um, client isolation will solve this problem. So the idea is, is that you, to give your customers the best experience and to simplify your network and avoid any complaints from gamers or working professionals or anything that say, there's too many layers of NAT. Well, you want to get rid of all those NAT layers. Those NAT layers are a pain in the ass. You only want net, uh, NAT at the presence to the internet. So at the public IP that the customer traverses, okay? 
that's it. NAT there, NAT at their router. Then you've only got, you know, technically double NAT if you're running CG NAT, but if, you're, if your things are set up properly, you've got UPnP enabled and all that wonderful stuff, and you're keeping your CG NAT ratio under 60 to 1, you shouldn't see any problems, okay? I hope that all of this makes sense, because it's, it's pretty straightforward. You put your APs in bridge mode, you put your CPEs in bridge mode, you enable client isolation on the CPE, or on the AP, sorry, uh, you enable layer 2 isolation on your switch and you make sure that your router is set up accordingly so that either if you've got all of your interfaces uh, through port based VLANs, all those interfaces are participating in a port isolation group on that router or if it's just a single one, the switch is enough to cut it. But as long as there's layer 2 isolation from the customer's place all the way forward to the terminating router, you won't see DHCP polluting your network and you won't have the security issue of people breaking into things. And that also goes in hand in hand, by the way, the security aspect of having a management VLAN present on the last mile interface at each tower site so that you can elevate the access points and CPs out of the customer's broadcast domain and into a separate isolated virtual network where they cannot touch any of it. When you combine those factors in place, you're safe. I mean, like the customers can't touch anything they're safe because other customers can't mess with their gear. And if somebody tries to do any kind of layer two discovery, it's going to be a no-go. So, muy bueno. Yay. All right. So I hope that makes a lot of sense for you guys. Um, if it didn't make enough sense, just, you know, post in the comments below and I will clarify. And uh, the later part of the video here, uh, after this part, let's see how I do that. Because either I'm going to finish this video right here and make a few other videos involving how to set up uh, layer 2 isolation on switches. Or I'm going to set up some layer 2 isolation on some switches and uh, put them all in this video. But uh, it depends because I'm trying to keep the videos a little bit shorter so you guys don't like uh, get pissed off and... You know, we're all ADHD this day and age. Thank you, Orange Die. Yeah, so, anyway. All right, well, if this is the end of the video, who knows? Then, ciao for now. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, and uh, remember, uh, like and subscribe, and leave your comments below. Any uh, clarification that you guys need or better examples of how to set up this Layer 2 isolation. Um, yeah, just uh, leave them in below, and then I'll answer your comments for you. All right, so thanks everybody, and ciao for now. Bye.